Hi, I'm Levi, and this is Not About You. Not About You is a podcast about identity and social justice. I'm the producer and host of the show, and I wanted to make something where a white, straight, cisgendered man, that's me, connected with folks with different lived experiences from my own about the ways parts of their identities bump up against injustices. We talked about race, gender, religion, representation, protests, politics, relationships, and more. I'm putting out 10 episodes as a first season of the show. I'll put out five, and then a week or so later I'll put out another five. While they'll be numbered 1 through 10, you can certainly listen to any or all of them in whatever order you choose. Each of these conversations was recorded from late August of 2016 into mid-October of 2016, before the 2016 presidential election. My hope is that this series leads to more conversation and interaction. I want folks who are hesitant or new to standing in these struggles to feel more comfortable showing up for change and asking questions. I want underrepresented voices to have new ways to be amplified and supported. I've set up a voicemail line, 612-361-9261, where you can share comments, suggestions, and personal stories of your own that may be used in future episodes of this show. If you tell me which episode you're responding to, that will help me make follow-up episodes with voicemail responses. Call 612-361-9261 with your questions, comments, or stories. And other than that, you can respond on all the social media channels. I hope you'll listen with an open mind and an open heart. I know I've made a lot of mistakes in these conversations, and I'll make more to come. And I welcome you to join me as I, I try to learn and grow. This is not about you. My name's Peggy Flanagan. I am a citizen of the White Earth Nation. My family is the Wolf Clan, and I am a state representative representing the communities of St. Louis Park, Golden Valley, Plymouth, and Medicine Lake. And I also am the Vice President for Training Services for the Management Center in Washington, D.C. Nice. Yeah, and I'm a mom. You are, yeah. And a wifey. (laughs) (laughs) Well, thanks for talking to me. Yeah, my pleasure. Right away, this question. Native, mm-hmm. Indian, what uh, word is the least offensive? <laughs> so, that great question. I get that question a lot. When I was in college, I really was on fire and cared about this question. As I've, you know, gotten older, I care less so in that I primarily use the term native when talking about like Native American people either in like internally in my community or to the outside externally, internally amongst my my friends and my community. Uh, most often I say Indian. It sort of has changed over time. What I pull from that answer, mm-hmm. I mean, you said an answer, yeah. but is I feel like I should say Native you and not You should say Indian Native, yeah. Is what yep. I take totally. away from yep. me. Uh-huh. Um, and if you want to get real fancy, you can I, say I Anishinaabe or Ojibwe. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. both of those work Both for you, of the, right? those are, yeah, yeah totally and cool. An, Anishinaabe, does that mean First Peoples? Is mm-hmm. that accurate? It does, okay. yeah. Good work. Sure <laughs> well, I think the question I'm curious about from you, aside from just, oh, how should I, what word should I use? To, <laughs> is what are the questions that you get hit with around being a Native person by someone who is not a Native person? Sure. So there's two primary questions that I get. The first being, really? Because you don't look Native American, which is a question and a statement. Mm -hmm. And I think initially when that sort of question and statement would come up, I would panic didn't really know how to handle it and felt like I sort of needed to justify myself. And now my initial reaction is, okay, well, what's a Native American supposed to look like? And most of the time folks are like, oh, got it. But other times people don't get it. And they're like, well, you know, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, uh, well, Every day I wake up and I'm native and I look like myself, right? And so sometimes I've said, you know, you mean like like Cher coming in on a horse with a bikini and a headdress? Oh, no, 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 no. And I said, well, this is, this is what I look like and my people exist in a contemporary context. 
we rock jean jackets and, and scarves, which is what I'm wearing right now. Yeah. So, you know, so I hear that a lot. And then the other thing that I hear is, really? Because my great-great-grandmother was a Cherokee princess. And I would say, you know, there's lots of folks that have that sort of lore within their family or within their history. And, you know, it's not actually a thing, Cherokee princesses. And it's probably complicated history as to why that story was told in their family. But, you know, now I just say, oh, that's nice. Oh, really? Oh, that's just, interesting. Yeah. Unless... There is a, a person that I, I feel like, hey, we're going to have a, a longer term sort of connection, a relationship, and like we should probably talk about this. Otherwise, it's not necessarily my responsibility to sort of educate folks all the time about that stuff. Well, that's really I do it a lot. Um, yeah. But like in some moments, I'm like, cool, I'm at a buffet. I just want to get some more tiny sandwiches <laughs> like have a good night like i don't you know so Your uh, ignorance is interrupting right, right. My tiny sandwich <laughs> yeah absolutely exactly that's funny because yeah. that part of that is you only invest in the well now we're going to get real for a minute if you think there might be a relationship to be built mm -hmm. and yeah. otherwise you're like i don't i need to give my energy to this and i don't want that to sound like cold um no, you're protecting yourself yeah i guess i've learned how to you know sort of pick my battles mm -hmm. and I still feel like spread a little thin and exhausted sometimes talking about this stuff, but for the most part, I've just learned to take care of myself a little bit better. When it comes to things around my child, however, then it's a completely, completely different thing. Right. Um, if I'm needing to sort of protect her or speak on her behalf or on behalf of my community in a different context, I will throw down in, you know, a Minnesotan kind of way, mm -hmm. which is to be a little more polite about it, but certainly think it's important to let folks know, right, to sort of to tell the truth. Yeah, saying anything at all in Minnesota is throwing down. Yes, that, that's, <laughs> that is right, right? Like, you know, we come from the land of where you have to ask someone if they're hungry three times before they can say yes. Right. Like, it is this, this really interesting phenomena. And also saying interesting can mean something completely well, yeah. different here. It's not a compliment. You know, it's not, oh, that's interesting. Ooh, well, I, right? <laughs> I want to try and dig into both of those yeah. areas. Because one thing I do, maybe I'm being generous, mm -hmm. they both seem like attempts to connect with you. Yeah. Like, there's a yep. sincere attempt to connect. For sure. One, by saying, no, you're like me. Mm -hmm. Is what it, that mm -hmm. sounds like, but mm -hmm. tell me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. And the other by saying, hey, I'm like you. Right. Like they're both relating in some yep. way. Yes. And so I think folks are coming from a good place. Uh, Which is worse in some ways. Right. Which, I wish you were just being a monster. And I could right. Go. Like many things that we have encountered as, as Native people have been done with the best of intentions <laughs> and haven't worked out so well for us. But, you know, I think that that's right. Or I've had sort of follow up to that. I remember this a conversation with a woman who, who said, like, you know, I would love for my, my kids to learn how to speak Native American. Where can they learn how to speak Native American? And I was like, Okay, so there are over 500 different nations within the United States or the borders of the United States. And so you might want to get a little bit more specific about which language uh, you'd like them to speak. So, you yeah. know, like, <laughs> so again, it was an attempt to, to, you know, to try to connect and learn more. And But I think like a, a big place of where this comes from is we simply like don't tell people that Native Americans still exist. It's a historical At all. group. Yeah. That's how it's viewed. Absolutely. And it is viewed as a sort of monoculture history group. Exactly. I think. Exactly. Even in like textbooks. Completely. In some ways it's that's how how the educational system um, in Minnesota, right, has mm -hmm. cheated people from knowing knowing the truth. I didn't know about the war of eighteen sixty two until I was a grown up and I grew up in St. Paul. Right? Yeah. And if anyone else hears this and is like, what is that? <laughs> Please look it up. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. So as a state legislator, I'm in the Capitol a lot. And the images of Native people are all historical, quote unquote, historical. And these are just the images that literally, like in the people's house, bombard people whenever they walk in the door. And those are, are things that, that need to change. The first time I went to, I used to be the executive director of Children's Defense Fund Minnesota. 
and was the co-chair for the Raise the Wage campaign, where we worked to raise the minimum wage to 950 index to inflation. And it was the first time that I was going to testify at a committee hearing in my new role That's as a big the deal. executive director. Yeah. yeah, and I was you know super excited and nervous. And I like walk into the room, it's packed, and on the back wall there's this painting with like a bunch of dead native people in a field. And I was like, whoa, like is this here all the time? Or is this just for for me? Did you know that I was coming? (laughs) Turns out it's there all the time. And, you know, it's like the the Battle of Brown County when essentially, you know, the government was literally like starving uh, the Dakota people in southern Minnesota. And they'd had enough and wanted to, I don't know, feed their children. So this is the, the image that is within a hearing room within the Capitol. And no one sort of bats an eye. We're just bombarded with these images all the time. And so, like I said, in in some ways, I can understand where folks are coming from um, because they just haven't been exposed to it. But it's getting harder and harder, I think, to to not see Native people, especially like literally right now with what's going on at Standing Rock and the protests against the Dakota Access Pipeline. And I realized that my, you know, we talk about the FBI, like Facebook Indians, right? Like that is like there's just uh, we are on social media and force. And so my entire feed has been about what's been happening there. And I'll share things and we'll hear from like non-Indian folks who say, I had no idea this was happening like a couple of weeks ago. And it's just so funny. I'm like algorithms, like this is all I'm hearing and sort of seeing. So that's also things that are sort of set up in a way to keep people, you know, isolated or within. um, Well, the Standing Rock protection, Mm -hmm. the standing on Standing Rock, seems intentionally underreported. Yeah. And I'm not conspiracy. Mm -hmm. I can't even pronounce the word. That's how <laughs> not into it I am. But that is my perception. Is yeah. that, I mean, do you see that as a general trend for Native issues? Yeah, I mean, and, and it may also be, be coming from that there's a lot of journalists who simply, again, don't know that we're here, right. haven't had experience. Or don't you know, want to do it us. wrong, too. Right, don't like, want to do it fear wrong. Of looking dumb. Yeah, totally. It doesn't stop people enough. Right, but. yep. So that, you know, that's certainly part of it. The New York Times has started to have more coverage. Uh, Lawrence O'Donnell has been there a couple of times. I was like, hey, Lawrence O'Donnell, like, <laughs> all right. So that's that's been good, you know, and, and it's starting to get to get more attention. But yeah, I think that there, you know, somebody certainly benefits when the full story isn't being told. And, you know, those folks are often people who are profiting off of the resources, the land, and, you know, the people who are going to experience the most, will be the most negatively impacted. Here's a, a question that I'm going to unfairly ask you to unpack. Yeah. The, the idea of somebody saying either you don't look Native, I mean, mm-hmm. essentially denying that a modern Native person exists. For sure. Like that as an mm-hmm. entity. And somebody saying, well, I'm modern and I have a connection to mm-hmm. my Native past as well. I've seen dances with wolves. <laughs> right. Uh, um, yeah. I think embedded in both of those is not only the the trauma that Native people did experience Mm -hmm. a long time ago, but then that perpetuated itself, Mm -hmm. but also the trauma of silence or obfuscation. Mm -hmm. So there's, you can't really heal from Mm -hmm. the the sort of initial government destruction, like colonist destruction, and then the formalized federal government Mm -hmm. destruction, and then like still, I mean, the pipeline is a good example Mm -hmm. of that still going on. Right. My question is, how does anything get to being positive representations of Native people if there's so much backlog of needing to unpack all this trauma and make the public know about all this trauma so that healing can happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think one of the things that, you know, I think about a lot is that most of the Native people that I know have wicked senses of humor. Mm. And it has been the reason that I believe why we... Yeah, pretty dark, dark humor. (laughs) But also has been one of the biggest reasons why we have survived and why we're still here. So I think there's really, there's something to that. In this age of social media, everyone is now able to tell their own story for themselves. Native folks, I think, have embraced that more, in some ways, more than than uh, a lot of other communities. And part of part of the reasons why I think it's so powerful is that, like, even if you're not at Standing Rock, you can still participate. You can feel connected. 
people are, you know, I've got good friends, other Native friends who are all across the country, different urban communities, different reservation communities. We all sort of hold each other up and cheer each other on but may not have seen each other in, you know, several months at a time. So I'm sort of thinking about that being this new opportunity and platform for us just to speak for ourselves, and I think that that's really powerful. You know, we have to acknowledge what has happened in the past and start just telling the truth, which I think goes a long way. I was having, just as an aside, which I think sort of gets to to a part of this, I was having dinner with good friends. Uh, Tim and I were having dinner with some good friends of ours. And Tim is my husband. And we went to Block Island in Rhode Island, uh, which is beautiful, a little beach vacation, and went and stayed with some friends who go there like every year. It was lovely. And had a a dinner conversation with some friends of our friends who were there, and one of them was a teacher, and was like, oh, you're Native American. So we sort of had this, this exchange, you know, then she started to say, like, I realize that, you know, there's, there's some pretty significant disparities with Native folks. And I was like, yeah, yes, right? Or she said, with Native American people or something. I said, yeah. And she's like, what are some of the strategies that you think, you know, we should start to implement? And I was like, I'm so glad that you're asking as mm-hmm. a teacher, yeah. right? As an elementary school teacher, that's, that's great. And I said, well, one of the things that we can start off with is to just start telling our kids the truth, right, about what happened. And certainly... We don't need to share necessarily the like bloody gory version, but you know should should talk about to the extent that we can that's developmentally appropriate and just really start telling the truth. And I watched this woman's face change, and she said, <laughs> "She's like, it's just, I mean, it's just so depressing. I don't think I could do it." And it was this just this moment where I was like, "Wow," because you're uncomfortable with this, right? You're not actually going to do the work that it's going to take to help to eliminate some of these disparities, mm-hmm. which is telling the truth to young people in your classroom because it's depressing. And, you know, and I said, well, if it's depressing to tell it, just imagine how depressing it is to live it. Who wants more tots, right? <laughs> like I just, you know, that was sort of the who wants pie kind of moment. And I was like, I guess this is probably the full extent of this conversation, but it it was, you know, this woman who's a teacher in like urban DC where, you know, to be fair, there aren't a lot of other native kids or native kids, but there certainly are kids of color. Well, there's depressing stories too. Yeah, Yeah. need to hear the truth. So I think that that's, you know, that's a big part of unpacking the trauma is just starting to, you know, it wasn't until like I got to college that started having the conversations, right? I sort of knew this growing up, but in school I was always taught like Columbus sailed in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and that's where it stops. And it's like, and discovered a land that was not his and enslaved people and was like a really bad dude. And, you know, so much of that by denying, like telling our young people the truth, we're like taking the opportunity away from them to become better full people who mm-hmm. can embrace other folks. So I think like that's a piece of it. You know, the the other piece is, is simply so much of what we, we romanticize, we as a society sort of romanticize Native Americans, like literally romanticize Native Americans as you walk through like any sort of bookstore and see, oh, yeah. you know, the like white woman with the, you know, strapping Native man with these historical romance novels yeah. or, you know. Um, well, even the idea of... Uh... They used every part of the buffalo. Oh, right, kind of totally. Thing. Right. It's you so know? romanticized. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, sort of the stories that we have, or even, you know, my husband, you know, was a Boy Scout. And, like, there's a lot. I was like, you did what? Oh, what? Just all these quote unquote ceremonies right. that they did as Boy Scouts. Ancient and traditions. Right, yeah. And now he's like, that was so mess up right so there's it's it's complicated and there's so many layers of it that i think many folks it has become part of their identity or you know i'll have someone say like i always wanted to be native american growing up which again is like this wanting to connect but oftentimes people want to connect or want to celebrate what it means sort of within their minds to be native and Mm -hmm. connected to the earth or whatever it is, sort of the stereotypes, the sort of like, you know, Disney Pocahontas image of uh, without the tough stuff. But I do have to check. Are you telling me you can't talk to animals? (laughs) I can't. Because if I could, our dog would be much better behaved. (laughs) Really good point. Yeah. He's he's a jerk. He's adorable. (laughs) 
He's the cutest dog you'll ever see, and he's lucky because that's why we keep him around. <laughs> One thing you mentioned is the dark sense of humor, mm -hmm. and I have experienced that. I grew up in Minnesota, mm -hmm. and I had a, a decent number of Native folks in my life in big and small ways. Mm -hmm. Still had plenty of effed up ideas mm -hmm. because of school. Uh, there's a lot of weird stuff happening mm -hmm. in school. But that, I really did see the dark sense of humor, which I really enjoyed. I mean, I mm -hmm. just enjoy that in general. But with that, you know, I think you, I see even that being used now to deal with, you know, there are, like you mentioned, this the use of an idea of Native to have a tradition at a camp. Even the name of camps, like mm -hmm. uh, in the Northeast particularly, mm -hmm. or even in northern Minnesota, that are like inappropriate appropriation riffs on Native word, kind mm -hmm. of. It's all very upsetting. There's the football team problem. Yeah. And there's other name, team name, there's yep. baseball team name problems. For sure. These are all incredibly upsetting. Mm -hmm. I'm not a Native. Mm -hmm. Even my ancient ancestors, <laughs> as best as I know. Uh -huh. And yet it really upsets me. Yeah. And I am not like you, living it and confronting it every day mm -hmm. and actively confronting mm -hmm. it. Like you are doing work. When you go on a stage, you always identify who you are. Mm -hmm. You always mention your clan and your, mm -hmm. your people. Mm -hmm. But you seem like a person who has a lot of joy and a mm -hmm. lot of pleasant passion for what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And that's impressive. I guess my question is, why or how? Like, why aren't you mad? So I mean, not that you're not mad. Yeah, no, like, I mean, because part of it is because fuck you, that's why. Um, I like that. Because <laughs> <Yeah. so, like, laughs> then they win, kind of? Yeah, yeah. yep. And I also have been fortunate to just be around funny people, in particular, funny women most of my life. You know, on my mom's side, my mom, my mom is uh, Irish Catholic, like five feet tall, blonde hair, blue eyes. She weighs like 98 pounds. I like outgrew her clothes in fifth grade. But all the women, you know, on my mom's side, at one time, you know, they've all been single moms or been divorced or just, like, fought like hell for everything that they have had and really struggled. And they're just wicked, funny, and loud. And, again, was sort of, like, how they also learned to survive. So I think that's just deeply, like, part of who I am. I also, like, my best friend, Lauren Anderson, is an improviser. Professional um, comedy writer yeah, and improviser. Yeah. <laughs> You know, my husband also is an improviser. <laughs> so I, you know, surround myself with funny people. And maybe it does come from also sort of being Minnesotan is when people get uncomfortable, you know, either we make a joke, we talk about food, whatever. Or you just shove you just, food right into That's right, you right. Or just, yep, eat your feelings, which are really good around here, good at around here. But I also think, like, it's like, okay, let's joke, pause, and keep powering through. Mm. So, and I also think people can hear things, right, through satire or humor in ways that they can't hear other things. And so I think it's sort of a tool to try to connect with folks as well. I don't know. I like weird stuff. Yeah, <laughs> it's a hard question. Why are you the way you right. are? Is... But I was like, you know, like growing up, you know, even now, like I've like the the also like. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about like my cousin Michael, who's not native, but is also an improviser. Growing up, like we were super tight and did weird stuff, and mm -hmm. and so I think that that's just sort of always been part of who I am, and different aspects of my life of has helped me survive. Not just sort of thinking about historical trauma, but also just like some trauma in my own life, um, yeah. which has been has been helpful. That's a big part of it, is you know because yeah, we're still here. I'm still here. For each of these 10 episodes of Not About You, I put out requests for folks to call in with responses to questions that come up in each episode. So a few people left voicemails, and I'll be sharing some of those in the middle of some of these conversations. You have reached the Not About You voicemail line. Leave a message after the tone. Hey, Levi. It's Taj. I hope you're well. Okay, so the next question I have that I'm going to attempt to answer is, have you had to deal with times when people thought you were praising an aspect of your cultural heritage but not realizing they were being hurtful or insulting? Yes, I have had to deal with that. Before, most of the time, people, one, they don't even know where Sri Lanka is, and that's usually the part of my heritage that people will try to praise and talk about but uh, not know really much about. So, so they won't know where Sri Lanka is, and then once they know or they hear I tell them, like, it's an island off the tip of India, 
And then they'll be like, oh, do you know MIA, the one other Sri Lankan person that is, like, prominent in the media right now? And it's, it's a little frustrating. I joke about it oftentimes. I'm like, yeah, she's my cousin. Actually, all Sri Lankans are my cousins. So it's crazy. It's so small. It's such a small little blip on the map. But hopefully they realize it's a joke. Although I have I had a couple of people go, really? And <laughs> I can't help but laugh. Um, and a lot of times people will assume my religious points of view because of that. One, I'm, I'm, I would say I'm an agnostic, but uh, I was raised Christian, and a lot of times people assume that I am, that I'm, that I am a Hindu or that I'm Muslim, but that's not the case at all. That's not really the primary religions either in Sri Lanka. So yeah, I get it a lot. A lot of times people will, ask, not a lot of times. Some people have asked me where my bindi is, which is uh, oftentimes what women wear on their forehead, and it's. It's a small dot, and it depends on the color, the meaning different things. Black or red are usually the most common. And, I, again, that has nothing to do with me being Sri Lankan, but people assume since it's near India, they ask me questions about what that is like. Again, I don't, I don't know. People assume a lot of times that all curry is, is – is, curry is just all one type. There are so many different types of curry depending on – what part of the country you're from, and, and not even tri- for Sri Lanka itself, but, like, in India, there are way so many different types of curries. There are curry, like, if you are in the in the north, and there's different curry if you live more south. So a lot of times people assume that kind of stuff, that it's all just kind of one big place, that everybody is exactly the same if you're from Sri Lanka or uh, India or Pakistan. It's, it's all the same uh, to a lot of people, and... Uh, yeah, just check, check yourself. Uh, do a little bit more research. Now let's get back to the conversation. You know, because, yeah, we're still here. I'm still here. And now I feel much more responsibility as the mom of, you know, a three-and-a-half-year-old uh, native girl in that before when I thought about like the mascot issue, the Washington football team or Cleveland baseball team, it was, this isn't right. It's racist. You know, we need to fight against this for a whole bunch of reasons. It's perverting our culture and tradition and in some ways our religious ceremonies. And now it's like, you're going to hurt my child. Mm. She gets to know, right, like who she is as an Indian woman and that this is a perversion of that and is not who she is. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly it feels like more urgent and more personal for me. And also because of social media, I feel like people are having this conversation more and be like, this is ridiculous. And the folks who want to hang on to this imagery, you know, again, it's either because of their identity or their tradition or a fear of loss. And that has been so much of what, you know, like I can I can understand those feelings. Yeah. And <laughs> there are other things that are available to you. Right. right? So, right. With team mascots, we've got animals and Native Americans, right? Or when folks say, well, what about the fighting Irish? Right, I'm like, yeah, not all Irish people or Irish Americans are stereotyped as being tiny little boxing leprechauns. It's you know? really rare. Yeah, <laughs> it's really <laughs> rare. Yeah, so, you know. It's part of the problem, but Irish being moved into the whiteness category, yeah. then the oppression just really shifts in that totally. area. Like that's, but that has not happened for Native people. No, it has not happened for Native people. And I think part of it is because there aren't a lot of us, you know, and Indian country is small, but mighty. <laughs> and I think, you know, I think that, again, sort of people just haven't had a lot of experiences with or know. But then it's sort of when I look at it, like, hey, we're, this is Minnesota. There's a lot of us here. Yeah. <laughs> right. Like you should. Like, you know, all, like spend very present. Like all over. Yeah. Well, so here's a mm-hmm. here's another challenging question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's what I'm going to do for mm-hmm. you. Obviously, I love humor. So that's part of it because mm-hmm. that's my background. But talking about humor and you knowing as a native person, how to deal with things with jokes and having some native family who deals with things. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure getting together with a bunch of native people, Mm -hmm. some really dark humor goes Mm -hmm. on when you're sharing stories of horrible things having happened. (laughs) Right. I think people get confused about then they can make some jokes. Yeah. And it actually helps to enforce holding on to some of those like Mm -hmm. team name problems and some Mm -hmm. of that 
uh, minstrelly, ho- inappropriate mm-hmm. Halloween cat, like the the right. sexy native chief yeah. thing. It seems like royal. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it seems all kind of rolled up into. Well, I, I, a native person made this really funny joke, and I mean that. There's all kinds of nuances to that mm-hmm. problem, but I wonder if you can talk about how aware you have to be of how you're talking in a certain space, so that you don't. You want to empower people to think differently and move differently. But you also sort of have this desire. You like to make people comfortable, but you're also okay with making them uncomfortable. Like there's really a balance there that yeah. you suddenly have to be the one catering to everyone's feelings. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And I'm they, also right, like in politics and so like, Yeah, I want to know about you. Like you also right. chose public service <laughs> yeah. to um, a place mm-hmm. that is a part of genocide. Yeah. So that that's yeah, complicated. which is like yeah, which is very complicated. It's yeah, that's certainly not just for the native community, but I think. It's something that folks in many communities of color, you know, or I think about some of my friends who, you know, are Jewish, where folks will make jokes about their community and be like, because you do, that's fine, right? And and again, it's oftentimes done out of that willingness to connect. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a couple different ways to respond. There's either like, <laughs> you know, you can't joke about that. Ah. Or like, hey, time out. Let's talk about like why I can make that joke, but you can't make that yeah, joke. Yeah. Or an additional way to react to that is to just like get upset and shut it down. Yeah. Which, depending on the situation, are always options. But yeah, like I think that oftentimes people of color feel, you know, and indigenous folks feel that responsibility to have to carry that. And in some ways, as a native woman whose name is Peggy Flanagan, this is like the story of my life, yeah. right? Like I've been sort of that bridge builder or can sort of weave in and out of dominant culture and my community too and have tried to help be helpful in that way and make connects and connections and help give, you know, a little bit more understanding to white folks who just don't have those relationships or knowledge and that's part of been part of my role. I think in the work that I do in the community, in the legislature, one of my favorite things or biggest accomplishments in this first session was that within our caucus, everybody says people of color and American Indians or people of color and Native Americans. And even that, while it may seem like a small victory, is pretty significant in that, you know, as we're talking about racial disparities or talking about these issues that now folks in like my caucus like really have that understanding that we talk about people of color and American Indians or and Native Americans because Native folks have an identity that is based as a government. It's government to government or, uh, you know, it's in the Constitution. And so just having that, like, moment to take a little bit longer to talk about folks in communities of color has made a has made a big difference. So it's sort of those, taking advantages of those moments where you have that space to be able to be like, hey, can we try this out? Why are we going to do that? Well, let me tell you. It's like, oh, okay, I get it. <laughs> um, and so even watching folks who are like, people of color, oh, wait, I'm sorry, people of color and Native Americans, right? And I'm like, thumbs up. It makes makes my heart sing. So you're, part of your work, part of what you're talking about mm-hmm. is just you're kind of reprogramming or retraining some folks. Mm-hmm. Not in a like, I mean, sometimes aggressive, mm-hmm. but like it's sort of just built into how you're doing political work mm-hmm. and how you're doing leadership work. There is a, a tricky space. I mean, some people just don't even like the word ally, mm-hmm. and so I don't, I don't know how that goes. But mm-hmm. I think of myself as an ally, and I try mm-hmm. to do that. There is a thing where there's allyship with the, like, where's my reward for, like, getting it right. Yeah. And it seems like a little bit of that is needed to sort of, like, coax someone along. Mm-hmm. But you don't want that to be the driver to do it all the time. Totally. So what would you say to someone who, like, really likes getting that as an ally, like how to get over that? Yeah. Or if someone who's like, I'm trying to break the cycle of me giving allies a cookie, I think is often sure. the sort of phrasing sure. that's used. Yeah. I mean, I love cookies. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that there are places, look, you know, through the majority of my professional career, right, I've been an organizer, mm-hmm. right? And organizing is about relationship building. And part of the way the the way to build good relationships with folks and then get them to take action or you know to move on something is to have that trust and to try to be kind and not nice i feel like it's really easy to be nice yeah. right i can be nice i can be polite but to be kind to someone 
I think takes intention. And so I guess, at least with my colleagues, you know, in the House Caucus, in the DFL House Caucus, like, I want to try to be kind because we're trying to move big stuff together. And, and that's, that's necessary. So I don't exactly know, right? Like, I don't carry around a packet of like scratch and sniff stickers. I'm like, good job, right? Maybe I should, I don't know. But, you know, we want things sort of reinforced that like are good, like keep doing that. Or for example, on your Facebook page just the other day, there was an interaction um, that you had and I sent you a note and just said like, I really appreciated the way Mm -hmm. that you handled the situation. Not because like that was a cookie, but like I literally was like, ugh, thank you. (laughs) Because <laughs> um, it can be kind of exhausting to have to correct that or fix yeah. that. And again, picking battles, I was like, <laughs> I'm not, no. this is not. And I would say the opposite of that is when people are having conversations on Facebook and something comes up about folks from the Native community and then someone like tags you in a post. So like for everyone who's listening to this podcast and wants to figure out how to be a better ally, don't do that. <laughs> Stop doing that. It is not the responsibility of... It's just throwing somebody into a bad situation. Right? And like, and then I feel like a jerk if I don't, if I don't chime in and try to protect the person who like asked me to come in and, and weigh in anyways. And the other day, my, a good friend of mine, Sarah Barrow, she went into Patina. Uh, I used to work at Patina when I was in college back in the day. And one of the reasons that I needed to leave that establishment, because they had a lot of imagery in the store, you know, geisha dolls or remember there, there was this um, like wind up little Native American like bare chested with like a tomahawk who's on a horse. You wind it up and he like galloped across the table and I was like, what is this, right? As an American Indian Studies minor at the University of Minnesota, I was like, um, this, we can't, this, it's not okay. Filed a complaint and then they just simply moved the merchandise to another store is what I found out later. Nice. Yeah. So, you know, that was several years ago. You complained and then they relocated yes. the Native Americans? Yes. <laughs> Tale as old as time. Uh huh. Yes. Yep. And so now Native folks are trendy again. And so back at Patina, there's like... Fashion trendy Yes, too, we're super is... fashionable. So like right now in the stores, there's Pendleton blankets, which, you know, it's fine. But like tchotchkes of totem poles that are like bottle openers and like big dream catchers. And she wrote a letter. She said, hey, like, I just want to... Have you been to Patina lately? And I was like, no, what's going on? And she said, well... And, you know, so Sarah told me everything that she saw there. She's like, I'm going to write a letter. And it was this beautiful moment where she's like, I'm just going to do this because I am upset Hmm. about it. Not like, what do you think I should say? She just did it. She's like, hey, here's her response that I got. This is what I'm going to say back, right? Which was like, we're, you know, the sort of same old, we're just honoring the community. We have some friends who are... Can you take a, a sec? Yeah. And tell me mm-hmm. why that's not okay? I think mm-hmm. I know. But like, right. sure. Why is it not cool for a novelty gift shop to sell dream catchers? Yeah. Well, cultural appropriation is what that is. Right. Um, is essentially like profiting off of something that is not yours mm-hmm. to profit off of. If Patina was like working with local native artists of which there are many and selling like legit native art within their stores that would be one thing but something that's like made in china again is just profiting off of a community without actually paying sort of debt to that community and it's stealing that's a good it's stealing and misrepresentation yeah it's stealing and misrepresentation That's yeah, all. so don't do it. And, you know, for... <laughs> so don't do so it. So don't do it. Um, don't steal. Yeah, don't, don't steal. You are a mom. Mm-hmm. I am a mom. <laughs> Put that down. Yeah, that's not yours, right? And and so, So she you know, wrote these letters. And yeah, so she wrote these letters and went back and forth. And, you know, the response was, you know, yeah, not great. But she just wrote back and said, well, like, I, I hope that, you know, you really take what I said to heart because I've shopped in your establishment for a long time and probably won't until this problem is corrected. And, and I just really appreciated that. I thought, you know, I don't have to do this at all. I get so worked up about that kind of stuff. And it's not always my battle to fight that there are other people who are like, mm-hmm. yeah, I think this is wrong too. And I'm going to like, I'm just going to take care of it, which is pretty cool. I like that idea that if somebody sees something and they know it's not okay, 
you have, don't have to go find your native friend to, mm -mm. hey, will you send a letter or is yeah. it like... Totally. They're just like, yeah, yep, I agree. Not okay. Yeah. Like Lauren has done something. Lauren Anderson has done something very similar, actually, also with Patina. So this is not the podcast to, you know, to rip on them, but to, you know, hope that more establishments avoid cultural appropriation. And for anyone who's interested in sort of going a little bit deeper into this particular issue, yeah. the blog Native Appropriations is Fan, like phenomenal when folks have questions about that kind of stuff or like why is this wrong and like mascot imagery or that is always where I send them it just it's it's done in a kind way but also really a formative way and sort of talks about the history of um, many of those images and just think can be super helpful if people want to kind of figure out a little bit more like why their issues with cultural appropriation I love that resource I will also mm -hmm. say correct me if I'm wrong but if you sell art things, craft things, and you're not sure, why not partner with Native artists? Because there are, as you said, a lot. Totally. There's a lot in Minnesota, but I know there are all over the country. Yeah, absolutely. And sadly, you can get them cheap. So yeah. Like, we're, <laughs> yeah. You know, like, um, take advantage that way. Yes. Yeah. So <laughs> Beyond Buckskin hmm. is also a great resource. It is uh, both a blog about Native fashion and culture. And it's also, there's a website, like a boutique that they have associated with it too, which is features all Native artists. So if you want to get some really beautiful, high quality uh, Native jewelry, t-shirts, other, other things, I probably spend too much there, but really be all beautiful, high quality stuff that's like totally legit. Well, I, so I usually ask people how I can help someone can, like mm -hmm. you can help. I feel like you've already like touched on that a mm -hmm. bunch. Go read these sites. Go spend yeah. money in these ways. Don't support this thing. Mm -hmm. Check your language. Like, I think you've hit all that stuff. So instead, I want to ask you, because you are in public service. You're mm -hmm. a representative. Yep. You've been like, I know you as someone who's just had a passion for politics yeah. for a long time. And there's a thing I've heard, and I don't know, I don't know how to vet it even, yeah. is that the Native community broadly, mm -hmm. and I know that there are a lot of different nations, yep. is wildly patriotic to the U.S. Totally. And there's a lot of people trying to understand why that is. And I've heard explanations of, well, it's their land that they're protecting, <laughs> even if it was stolen. Uh -huh. So I'm curious if you can sort of talk about that a little bit and talk about why service matters to you when you are at this weird intersection of fighting for a country that, in a very organized way, has tried to kill you. Yeah. And so, you know, like, <laughs> just that. It's never but sort of been phrased to me. I was like, oh. Right, yeah, that's, yep, uh-huh, uh, I mean, there's yeah. the take it down from the inside idea, but I, <laughs> right, I don't yeah. know. Like, I don't want to plant that seed where folks are like, she's infiltrating no, the I don't, government. No, I don't no, get that from like you that. at all, um, but, but <laughs> I think a lot of people could go, certainly in Minnesota's political representation, where it's not fast, but the changing color and gender of our yeah. public sector it's and changing. our public leaders mm -hmm. is beautiful. Yeah. But also, I am, part of me is like, but why, man? Totally. We have been nothing but hurtful to you guys. For sure. So, great question. A couple things. Like, one, fun fact, is that two additional Native women are running for the legislature this year. They will likely be elected. So nice. we will have a total of four Native women in the House. And you're glad because you come from abundance, not <laughs> That's exactly right. I'm super excited. And we will have a Native caucus, like a legit Native caucus. Nice. There's also a woman who's running, a Native woman running for uh, the Senate up at Mille Lacs. So also uh, very exciting. And um, my goal is to have a sort of rival Montana with the Native uh, leaders. And they're also the two other women who are running for the House are running from the suburbs. Like me, right? <laughs> there are Native people in the suburbs. We're everywhere. Weird. Yeah. You are in Yeah, we are. You know, I volunteered for Paul Wellstone in 2002. And it changed my entire life. I was going to be an early childhood special education teacher and then volunteered for Paul my senior year of college. And after we lost Paul and Sheila, I remember this moment where, you know, we, there's no more money left. And so people are like literally like hand making signs with marker. And, you know, in this back room, I got marker all over my arms and my face and there's all these kids everywhere. And I just looked around the room and I was like, oh, this, this is what I'm supposed to do. And at that time, in 2002, did I, I like didn't think like, oh, well, that means run for political office. But I thought it meant that I'm going to like be engaged and involved in electoral politics because I have seen those used, you know, in a really good way to empower communities. So I feel fortunate that that is sort of the 
the birthplace of my political involvement was with Paul and um, that he cared deeply for the Native community. And I was able to continue much of that work when I was at Wellstone Action through our Native American Leadership Program and training Native activists across the country and folks to run for office who are now in like various positions of leadership themselves across the country. And so I just simply see it as like, this is my tool or my role in the community to be able to provide access and to ensure that our voice is at the table. When I think about leadership or how it's been explained to me by my mentors from the community, it's that we're all sitting in a circle, right? We're all standing in a circle. And that you step to the middle of the circle when it is your time. And then when you are done, you step back out. And so no one's role is more important than anybody else's. So if I am a legislator, if I'm a teacher, if I'm a grandma, an auntie, a janitor, engineer, like everybody has a role um, and a gift that they've been given by the creator, a gift that they've been given by the creator. And it is your job to use that gift to make your community and the lives of your people better. And so I'm a nerd when it comes to politics. (laughs) I am a big old nerd and I love it. And like this year has been hard for everybody and I do not recognize it, but I still believe in it. And when I don't believe in it anymore, it will certainly be my time to step out of the circle. So the answer is I am also the child of both of my parents. My mom, whose first job out of high school was to move to Washington, D.C. and work on Hubert Humphrey's presidential race in 1968. And my dad, who continues to get arrested protesting over treaty rights, um, you know, in Washington, D.C. And so I'm just, I think that perfect combination of, you know, wanting to make sure that we have access to the system so that we can change the system to ensure that in the long term that our voices are reflected in the decisions that are made. And frankly, you know, I think when democracy does not reflect the community it seeks to represent, it like cannot function um, in the way that it is meant to. And when I think about like voting, that's something we've been doing as Indian people since like time immemorial, right? Making decisions based on consensus. So that doesn't feel like a disconnect, like a disconnect to me. So I simply think it's my role, I love it, and now I get to represent the community that raised me. And know that like there's a Native American kids club at Peter Hobart Elementary School, right? Where Siobhan is gonna go and we're gonna go have pizza with the students in a couple of weeks. So I don't know, it's tricky and sometimes it can be a little exhausting. And this election season I think has been hard on everybody, but I am really lucky. I'm really lucky that I get to do this job and that I get to represent Native folks and non-Native folks and figure out like how to build power for people of color within the legislature and like, you know, have a inside outside game of being really intentional on what we're trying to move inside the Capitol and building power outside with community groups. So make sure that folks like are holding us accountable and can figure out the ways to to make that happen. So (laughs) it's complicated. That's for sure. And sometimes I continue to, I catch myself if I'm sitting in a committee hearing or at a different like a meeting with sort of like big dogs out out in the community where sometimes I feel myself shrink and I'm like the kid with the different colored lunch ticket. And that can sort of change the way that I engage with folks or if someone makes a joke or says something inappropriate that I will sort of just shut down. But increasingly so, I have started to say like, yeah, I was the kid with the different colored lunch ticket. I was one of a handful of like native kids in my school growing up. And I have a responsibility to represent those kids at this table or whatever table that I happen to be sitting at. So. I wanna take more of your time. Maybe, because I know this will just just like too much to unpack. (laughs) But I feel like you've kind of gotten around it. So I Mm -hmm. wonder if you would just say, you have made and are now raising, as you said, a little native girl Mm -hmm. who lives in your house. Mm -hmm. She does, she lives in my house. She eats my food. (laughs) When you look at her and you think of her being a grown up someday, by and large, from the perspective of being a native person, optimistic, pessimistic? I am optimistic. I'm optimistic, well, one, because she's Siobhan, 
just because of who she is. She's got um, confidence. Already. Yeah, she's confident. She's she's weird, like in a good way. She's really, you know, you can tell, right, that she is our kid. Like, she's she's funny and dances and sings all over the house all the time. You know, and the other day we went up to Mille Lacs for the powwow, and she got her first, um, well, she had a jingle dress when she was itty bitty, but she could hardly even walk when it fit her. So she has her new jingle dress. And when I saw her put that on, I just was like, this kid, she's going to, you know, she's going to be okay. You know, and I think about this all the time. I want her to be proud of me. I want her to be proud that I'm her mom. And I want her when she is an adult or when she is a mom or a grandma to be able to clearly see that there is work that that happened that laid a path for her, for her and I am so aware that there is work that happened that laid a pathway for me and that she feels a responsibility to continue to make a way for the other folks who are going to come after her no matter what she does right if she's a supreme court justice or the president of the United States she you know when we ask her what she wants to be she says a president not the president so i think she's leaving herself a lot of options president of a company you know president of a foundation you know whatever so you know she's she's got some time to figure it out but yeah i think and this is a whole other podcast but many people n- many native people myself included believe that this is the time of the seventh generation and that what is happening at Standing Rock right now is that people are are waking up and, you know, you hear folks say that we're protectors, not protesters. And it is deeply rooted in identity and responsibility and that things are things are changing. So I think she will be she will be part of that change. Exactly what she decides to do with that, we'll see. The other day she told my mom, I can't believe I'm going to tell you this, but she told my mom, she was mad at my mom because I think my mom said, you know, it was babysitting. And she said, like, you can't have another cookie or something. And she said, oh, yeah, well, I'm voting for the piggot. The piggot is Donald Trump, who my mom and my auntie uh, have dubbed the piggot. He's a pig and a bigot, right, in one person. And Siobhan knew that that would cut to the core of my mom. And, you know, and she, like, looked, she had her hands on her hips and, you know, looked, she just scrunched her face all up. And my mom just sort of looked at her for a second. And she goes, Grandma, i just kidding. But it was this moment where I was like, oh, man, she's going to be like the native Alex P. Keaton. That's going to be what happens. And that will be her rebellion. So it was just this moment where I was like, okay, and then she'll come back around. <laughs> but I'm like, you know, that can- that could be what happens. Yeah, she'll be Ebenezer mm-hmm. Scrooge. That's right. That's exactly right. Yep. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, Peggy, I really appreciate you talking to me. My pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity. That was my conversation with Peggy Flanagan. I can't say enough how much I appreciate Peggy sharing her time and sharing so openly with me. I, uh, I'm going to already be seeking Peggy out for a follow-up episode post-election. I I think she's got more to say, and I am really hopeful that we can have another conversation. I also want to say a a big thank you to Taj for calling and leaving a message. I really appreciate that. The theme song for Not About You is Rebels of Our Own Kind by Minneapolis musician Charlie Van Stee. If you'd like to leave a comment, a story of your own, any kind of feedback, the voicemail is 612-361- 9261. You can also interact with us on social media, and the hashtag is NAYPOD, NAPOD. You can find Not About You Pod on Twitter. You can also find me directly. I'm at that Levi. I hope you will share comments, feedback, and share this show with other people. I want to get this out to as many people as I can to broaden and expand these conversations. If you have time and you are willing and you want to review the show on iTunes, that helps get more people aware of the show and helps me grow and connect with more folks. If you have suggestions of people I can connect with, I'm always looking to connect with more activists, organizers, educators, thinkers, artists. Any feedback you have, 612-361-9261. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Thank you for sharing the show with others. This has been Not About You.